So hello everyone and good afternoon. Uh, it's a somewhat overcast and slightly chilly day here in West Lafayette, which is a nice break from the hot weather we've had recently. Um, and uh, it's it's not quite cold quanta, but it is uh, it is nice uh, nice weather here for being inside and, and listening to this symposium. Uh, our speaker today is Laura Thomas, and she's the Senior Director of National Security Solutions at Cold Quanta, which is a company that does work in, no surprise, uh, quantum technologies. Uh, she's had an experience in the US intelligence community, has worked with the National Security Council, Department of State, Department of Defense, and basically a number of other people who are very interested in advanced technology, its applications, and its potential threats. This has put her in a great position to be able to understand those topics and to turn around and then present them to us. So please welcome uh, Laura Thomas and she'll talk to us about the national security implications of quantum technology. Laura, thank you for being here. All right, thank you so much for having me. I'm really thrilled. Uh, I was thrilled to get the invitation. So yes, I'm, I'm gonna be talking to you all today about uh, all things quantum, well, I guess all things non-technical about quantum, that is, I think because to really understand it, you would have to have an advanced degree in physics or mathematics, and, and even then it would still be uh, quite difficult to understand. Um, a quote from a recent book that I've been reading um, by a physicist named Carlo Rovelli, he said that you know, quantum theory has never been wrong. It's the beating heart of today's science, yet it remains profoundly mysterious and subtly disturbing. And then we have another quote from another famous physicist, it's Niels Bohr, and he said, those who are not shocked when they first come across quantum theory, well, they possibly, or they cannot possibly have understood it. And then he followed that up with, I do not like quantum mechanics, and I'm sorry I ever had anything to do with it, you know, which I, I found kind of funny considering that's pretty much everything that I'm working on right now. Um, and then we, of course, have Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman, and he said nobody understands quantum mechanics, and he was including himself uh, and a lot of physicists, a lot of his physicist colleagues at the time. So with that, uh, I'm going to try to help you understand the absolute basics of, of quantum technology and the applications in the national security space. Um, however, if you have a highly technical background and you have questions that you'd like answered, that are very technical in nature, you know, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I can get you an answer. Um, I can also give you some recommended reading if you would like to explore that side a lot more. Um, so to get started, if we have a talkative audience today, you know, I'd love to hear either in the chat or maybe it's in the question and answer function. You know, when you hear the word quantum, you know, what's the first thing that, that comes to your mind? And then, you know, once I flip to the, the next slide, I'll tell you the first thing that, that I thought of when I first heard quantum. So I'm looking in the chat here. Does anyone want to give an answer? Oh my gosh. Uh, Gavin, and your last name's Thomas too. I think we're, we must be related somehow. Smallest unit, yes. Sam Beckett, yeah. <laughs> Super advanced technology, indeterminism. Okay. So let me flip to the next slide here. Indeed, uh, this was my first thought when I heard quantum, which is what Gavin said. Um, you know, I, I think some of the audience, maybe you're my age or maybe you're younger, and maybe you don't know what, what this slide is, but when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, there was this wonderful TV show called Quantum Leap, and it's depicted on the left. And basically the protagonist of the show, he was a physicist and he could leap through time. He could take on different personas to alter the course of history. And then on the right, uh, I added in MacGyver, which was another excellent TV show of the same era. Uh, it's about a guy who worked for a clandestine intelligence service and he could uh, essentially nonviolently, he could change the world by using a Swiss army knife and apparently in this, this picture, uh, a match. 
And MacGyver has nothing to do with quantum, but in my mind, those two, these two shows sort of run together. And um, I think maybe they had more of an impact on me than, than I realized at the time because I ended up working in both uh, fields, you know, first as an intelligence officer and now I'm working for quantum computing and some company. And I'll talk a little bit more about my intelligence background a little bit later. So going to the next slide. So what is, what is it really? Um, and so the word quantum, it's just the plural of quanta and in Latin, you know, how much? And in physics, it's, it's basically the smallest amount of any physical entity. And in the quantum world, we're looking at the level of the individual atom and its electrons. And you know, the TV show that I, I really enjoyed in my younger years, Quantum Leap, well, the name is actually derived from uh, when an electron jumps in orbit around an atom. And it's, this is sort of the crux of quantum theory that you know, these electrons, they don't necessarily move in a defined trajectory. Um, they're more like waves or events rather than uh, things. And quantum theory is really the theory of how things influence each other. And famous physicist Erwin Schrodinger, who uh, came up with the famous metaphor of Schrodinger's cat, um, you know, a quote that he said is, it's better to consider a particle not as a permanent entity, but rather as an instantaneous event. Sometimes these events form chains that give them the illusion of being permanent, but only in particular circumstance and only for an extremely brief period of time in each individual case. And then if we go back to more current time, uh, physicist Carlo Rovelli, he gave what I think is a, a good metaphor for it. And, you know, if we're sitting in the Atlantic Ocean and we're on a boat, you know, we could absolutely see each wave, we could feel the wave, you know, some might be enormous, some might be small, but if we're sitting on the moon or standing on the moon and looking back to earth, you know, the ocean, it would look like a very permanent object to us because we're, we're looking at it from a distance and, it, you know, it doesn't move. And quantum physics basically says that even the things that we look at today in front of you, your computer, your chair, your desk, uh, it, it doesn't exist in the permanent form that, that we're actually seeing it. And that was what was so disturbing to physicists when they first discovered quantum theory. You know, basically the world does not work in the way that, that we observe it. And you know, it made uh, them and us still today, you know, we're constantly questioning our reality based on it. So I'm gonna briefly speak on two topics that you, know, you often hear when anyone's talking about quantum and those are superposition and entanglement. So first with superposition, the idea of superposition, it's very hard to render into words. And, and how I'm going to describe it is a bit more metaphorical and, and not 100% you know, the way it works in physics, but it's, it's the notion that an electron, an atom can be in more, you know, one, more than one state. Um, and it can, its spin can be you know, up or down or different variations in between. And it's really that when we go to measure it is when it gets fixed into uh, one state. And if you look on the right here, uh, it's a fairly typical picture uh, representation. It's known as a block sphere. And electrons can be spin up, spin down, or, or all the variations in between. And you know, I'm sure this audience is, is well aware, much even more so than, than I am, you know, how everyday computers function and that computers and information, you know, it's, it's running off of bits. And bits are a very binary system. And bits are either in the one or zero state. And it's these strings of ones and zeros that essentially make up uh, computing today. But because of superposition, we can build quantum bits known as qubits, and they don't have to conform to this binary state. They can be one and zero uh, at the same time, but also all the values in between and in between in the spin state up or the spin state down. And that essentially opens up a lot of computational power and it's why everyone is, is so excited about quantum computing. And then second, entanglement. Entanglement is, is simply the phenomena that uh, two particles associated with each other, they'll always know each other's state, even when the particles are split apart and different actions are performed on them. Inherently, the particle in another location will, will know uh, what is happening to the particle in the, you know, the, the base station, so to speak. So, you know, if, if there's a particle here in Washington, D.C., and then there's a particle where you are, um, 
intrinsically they, they understand what each other is going through in, in a metaphorical way. And Einstein called this spooky action at a distance. And you know, from the layperson uh, like me, it, it sort of it seems to uh, defy common sense that that can be the case. Um, so that you know, that's much more on the theory and the, the physics side. You know, what does it actually mean for us today uh, with technology? And you know, it means we can take these properties and, and the phenomena and use them to build quantum computers, quantum sensors, and quantum networks for communications. I'll go to the next slide. Um, a little word of caution. Um, you know, we have to accept that this physics is it's really hard and that we're over, oversimplifying it. Um, going back to physicist Richard Feynman, you know, he once said that um, quantum electrodynamics, which is what he won the Nobel Prize for, that if it were possible to describe it in a few sentences, then it wouldn't have been worth a Nobel Prize. Um, so I think that's very true here. So now, you know, before I get into the applications, I'll, I'll walk you through a bit of why I'm here, why I care so much about this emerging technology. And it's because most of my professional career, it was spent serving as a case officer with the Central Intelligence Agency. And a case officer is the person who recruits foreign spies, steals secrets, and jet sets around the world using an assortment of martial arts, shaken martinis, and, and you know, sometimes blackmail to get what they want. Uh, that's, of course, if you believe the movie version. Uh, reality is, is uh, a lot different and certainly less glamorous, but it is true that we recruit foreigners uh, to provide intelligence for the U.S. government, and we handle relationships with those individuals, and it is absolutely critical that uh, we do everything in our power, and I, I really mean everything to keep uh, those assets safe, and um, it, for a lot of reasons uh, that I won't necessarily go, go into here today. Um, but that's how I went down sort of this rabbit hole of quantum, because I first heard of quantum when I was working at the CIA. I was talking to one of our technical officers about encryption schemes, and I asked him, you know, how long would it take uh, a high-performance computer to break the current standards of encryption that, that we were using in a very specific case that I had? And he responded with uh, the answer that it could be thousands or millions of years. And he followed it up with something that got my attention. He said, well, that's if or until quantum computing really becomes real. And so I asked the natural follow on question, well, when does it become real? And his answer was disturbing. And he said, nobody really knows. It could be five years, it could be 20 years. So, you know, it, that again, it got my attention and I started doing a lot of you know, just uh, research just on Google and trying to understand what is this quantum uh, computing thing and, and do I need to worry about it as a case officer with the CIA? Because if we're working with encryption that eventually could be broken, you know, we need to understand how we can mitigate the effects of that and uh, prepare for it in the future. And, you know, going back to working at the CIA, you know, I think what a lot of my job was, was to discern between truths and lies and everything in between. And, you know, understanding people's motivations. And part of that has somewhat made me uh, a natural skeptic or it's at least tapped into maybe that, that stream that was already within me. And you know, once we believe in something, you know, we, we spend a lot of our time trying to justify why we believe it rather than questioning it. So I, it was very important to me to, to go to see what, what are the skeptics of quantum saying and um, you know, would that sway my opinion? So I started reading a lot about uh, what the skeptics were saying and, and their answers and sort of seeing what they were saying evolve over time. And it made me a bit more bullish on, on the fact that the idea that, that quantum technologies were one, real, and uh, two, that there's a significant benefit in, in quantum, um, especially quantum systems when you combine them with classical systems. You take a quantum computer and you, you know, marry it up with a classical computer. And that it really will outweigh, outweighs you know, the traditional approach that we have and that will solve a subset of problems that we just simply can't solve on regular computers. And that the technology, uh, there is a pathway for scaling it. So that's how I ended up leaving the CIA and, and joining a, a quantum computing company. I'll go to the next slide here. So on the national security space, 
you know, quantum, it, it really is a double-edged sword. Um, you know, U.S. government officials, they've made statements that have made it very clear. Uh, the U.S. government wants to make sure that it understands the power of the technology from a defensive perspective. And, you know, what happens if a hostile country or a country that has interests that are very counter to ours, you know, what if they can marshal the, the power of, of quantum to break all encryption? What happens to our most sensitive U.S. government communications? And, and it's not just U.S. government, you know, national economic security is national security. So what happens if, if public communications that are still extremely sensitive or proprietary in nature, you know, like banking transactions and, and personal email and medical records and anything related to intellectual property, you know, what if that can easily be um, broken and, and stolen? And we've already seen the hacks in these areas and the, the general destruction that, that it creates. And, you know, the, there's a real question out there if a nation state were to give a quantum hacking capability, for example, to um, a group that they don't necessarily uh, embrace as their own, but they certainly use for their interests as we've seen happen time and time again, you know, it would make the colonial pipeline hack or the Sony hack, it would, it would make it look like child's play. So, you know, we already know that China, for example, is pouring billions of dollars into this technology. And, you know, that's on the defensive side for the US government offensively. What if we can offensively use these capabilities and you know, how much would that change the world order? and some of our strategic deterrence initiatives. And Isaac Asimov, he had a, a really good quote that um, he said, science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. And I really do think that, that we have to think about that. And you know, that conversation will quickly get political, it'll get philosophical, um, but it's these questions that we're going to have to grapple with um, in the future as a country, as a society, and, and really you know, um, as humanity across the world. Okay, so with national security, um, why does the national security community really care in addition to you know, the, the quantum computing and the potential threat to encryption, which again, quite long-term, but uh, eventually will be there. And it's for all of these reasons that you, know, you, can, you can see here, you can imagine um, looking at, oh, let me go back looking at all of these, where in the national security realm there would be interest. Uh, if you look at GPS, we have an over-reliance on GPS and the US government is, is trying to find ways for precision navigation and timing that get us off of GPS. And um, you know, with our military vehicles, for example, how could they navigate uh, without um, having to connect to a satellite somewhere? And it's not just vehicles, it's, it could be submarines, it can be um, UAVs, aircraft. And then there's a whole host of uh, optimization problems that it can solve. How do we uh, take our troops and how do we do logistics? How do we put the right people where they need to be? And how do we solve some of our you know, major issues with keeping vehicles, uh, the maintenance up on vehicles? And, and these are all very complex sort of mathematical problems that quantum computing could, could certainly address. Um, let me go to the next slide. So first I'll talk about quantum computing and uh, you know I'll talk about three things here, quantum computing, quantum sensing, and then quantum networking. So quantum computing, the first one, I'm not gonna uh, read exactly from the slides here, but um, you know, you'll see a lot in the news about quantum computing. And, and we've come a very long way in the last 10 years with, with computing. But if you read the headlines, you know, you'd think that we've solved the problem and there's a quantum computer that's just waiting to tell us all the secrets of the universe. And um, I, you know, as we see with quantum writ large, there's a big gap in how quantum computers work and our ability to explain them in very simple terms. And you know, as usual, uh, reality is a bit more nuanced. And the fact is we're still a, a very, or we, we're still in the very early phases of quantum computing. And you may have seen that Google a year or so ago announced they had achieved quantum supremacy. And you know, that means that they had solved a, a problem on a quantum computer that would have taken a classical computer you know, thousands of years to solve. And what's important to note here is that you know, the benchmarks that they used, they're contrived benchmarks. And it's, it's you know, in some ways a toy problem, you know, it's basically proof of concept. 
And we're still quite a ways away from a quantum computer that's going to solve a meaningful problem. But we are getting closer and closer. And you know, you'll see a range of estimates from anywhere from three to 10 years where um, we're really making a dent in the universe with, with the power of our quantum computers. And exactly who holds the record for the most qubits, it depends on who you ask, because different people have different ideas about you know, what standards need to be met to qualify um, as, a, as a quantum computer. Uh, but to go back to the encryption issue, to break encryption, we will probably need at least a couple hundred thousand, if not millions of, of qubits of computational power to do that. And where we are today is, is in the hundreds. So that gives you a sense of, of the challenges that would um, be ahead for that. Okay, so here's a, a very basic chart on the expected phases of quantum computing. Um, right now, we're still in the NISC era. What does that mean? NISC stands for Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum. And it just means early days. Um, there's a lot of noise in these computers and noise being things that, environmental things that, that affect the qubit's ability to function and, and properly perform uh, the computations or, or perform them in a, in a way that, that really gives us um, the sort of probabilistic answers that we're, we're looking for. Uh, 10 years out, we think there's certainly going to be, uh, it's gonna be a much different landscape around quantum computing. And then 20 years out, I mean, who, who can really predict it? That's so far away, but um, you know, we expect that a quantum computer will be able to do things that, you know, problems that we can't even uh, conceive of. For example, you know, with the iPhone, no one knew that the, the whole app industry was going to be an industry you know, 20 years from now. Um, in, in some ways, it's, it's sort of how we're looking at quantum. We don't even know what the applications will be in the future. So I'm going to move on to quantum sensing, and this is an area that's, that's really, it's, it's less discussed, but it has been around for quite some time, and uh, we're still in the early phases of some aspects of quantum sensing, but in, in other aspects, uh, with atomic clocks, for example, they've, they've been out for, for a while, um, but essentially quantum sensing is using the same uh, fundamental properties of quantum mechanics to take measurements and uh, use an atom and use the properties of it to sense uh, changes in the environment. And some of the things here on the left of the screen is what uh, you know, we, can, we can detect and sense using uh, uh, atoms. And then on the right, you'll see some of the applications uh, that would or that are derived from that. And then that turns into quantum sensing products. So like I said, atomic clocks, they exist today. They've existed for quite some time. Uh, for example, you know, a number of companies sell them. My company sells them. Uh, but going beyond atomic clocks, what are some of the products? It would be inertial navigation systems. That's a top priority that goes into, you know, can, we, can we truly, can we enable true, uh, truly autonomous vehicles a vehicle that does not have to rely on a GPS signal to, to operate and to operate in, in a way that is extremely precise. So when you do have you know, the child that runs out in front of the road, the vehicle, if it doesn't have GPS signal, it can still uh, perform the functions that it needs to perform. Um, going further down the list, uh, quantum RF, as we call it, it's essentially you know, signals detection and then gravimeters, gradiometers, is detecting changes um, in, in the earth using gravity and subsurface changes. So if we're looking, uh, you know, what, where's North Korea burying its nukes? That's a good example. Or what submarines are uh, lurking underneath uh, waters in, in the ocean. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about atomic clocks since it is probably one of the most advanced builds. Um, that sort of encompasses quantum sensing and why they really matter. So atomic clocks, they, they essentially, they're a timekeeping function like any clock, but they're extremely precise. And it, really precise timing is important for networks as I'm sure many of you understand um, already. So it, one thing that, that we're working on is how to make those atomic clocks even better and perform longer over time. 
Um, and then how do we use those clocks and combine them with accelerometers and gyroscopes to create an inertial navigation system that's wholly independent of GPS. Because like I mentioned earlier, I think most people, especially in the US government understand that you know, relying on GPS, it's, it's certainly a vulnerability. We know that it can be denied, it can be spoofed and you know, the national security community, we want to see how can we um, navigate in a way that, that does not um, peg us in a certain location as well. So there's certainly a, a defensive and offensive use of if we were to have a small device that uh, could fit in a backpack, for example, where we can navigate without having to rely on anything external. You could see the use case in that for um, aircraft as well, uh, plane and planes, but also drones and certainly ships and essentially any vehicle. And then going into quantum sensing, or sorry, quantum radio frequency, which is an aspect of quantum sensing. You know, the application space here is extremely broad. And again, this is all very dual use technology. So you can see where in the national security space, um, this would apply radar, LIDAR, generally uh, detecting if people are carrying weapons, um, increasing telecommunication. I mean, right now, if you go into some cityscapes, you don't get very good signal because of concrete or because of barriers, or if you're going into a tunnel. And you know, in, in some cases, that's just a minor annoyance. In some, it, it really could mean the difference in, in life or death. So how can, you know, using quantum phenomena, how can we increase uh, signal? And that would also decrease the power you would need in many devices uh, to connect to those signals. And then you know, lastly, we have quantum communications. Um, and you know, this is uh, an area that is certainly debatable about um, you know, where we're going to go as a US government. Are we eventually going to transition to some sort of quantum internet? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but there's certainly a lot of people researching and researching this and, and putting a lot of money towards it. And you know, today, most encryption, it, it's, it's based on the difficulty of factoring really large semi-prime numbers and decoding them with classical computers. It's just not, not really possible. And um, you know, quantum computers, they'll make most encryption standards today obsolete. That's on the sort of offensive side, but on the defensive side, we can use the same properties of quantum to create quantum networks and quantum networks they cannot be eavesdropped upon because um, they're fundamentally secure. So part of this quantum networking is quantum repeater development. And that's one thing that, that my company in particular is, is looking at. And you know, there are a number of, of players doing the same thing. And you know, it, it essentially is you have to take this information and you have to hold it for a period of time before you can broadcast it over a long distance because what good is a quantum network if it's just over a very short distance? It would just create, you know, secure communications over a very short area, and that's really not what we're going for. You know, how can we communicate with satellites, and then those satellites communicate with other places um, across the Earth uh, using a quantum network? Um, also, there the challenges with with quantum networking is it, we still face some of the same challenges of you can always have a human tell you. Uh, uh, the information you want. You could always recruit a spy to spy on the quantum network. So the idea that you know a quantum network is just going to make everything completely secure, well, that's not necessarily true um, because you still have the endpoints, as I'm sure you know many people on, on this uh, webinar understand very well, there's still areas of vulnerability. But fundamentally, the network between you know a quantum node is, is going to be extremely secure. And a quantum repeater is one of the hardest parts of the technology to create. How do you keep that data in a state um, that, that, that keeps the integrity of the data as you transmit it across a broad distance? And, and that's one thing that, that we're working on um, to help you know, eventually enable a quantum internet. And so here I have a, a basic timeline of, of what a number of industry experts at least have assessed to be um, 
how quantum networks will evolve. And you, know, you can see right now we're at the, the phase of post-quantum cryptography. That's essentially saying that you know, uh, we, can, we can roll out uh, this post-quantum cryptography on our networks and, and it will prevent future quantum computers from being able to decrypt uh, some of our data right now. Uh, that's a booming industry uh, and there's a lot of work going on with NIST to uh, choose the algorithms and the standards that they're going to deploy for these um, uh, networks. And then if you go all the way to the end here, we're talking the fully entangled internet, fully quantum internet. And I think the glaring thing when I saw this chart, for me at least, is it says timeline, but there's no timeline. And I think if, if any of you follow the quantum space, this is sort of a recurring theme. Um, it's really hard to predict you know, the, the actual uh, timelines associated with it. In some ways you can compare it to predicting a hurricane. I mean, generally we know when hurricane season is and we know somewhere in Florida is definitely going to get hit every year. But saying that a hurricane is going to be, you know, taking this specific path and it's gonna be on this specific date, well, that's really difficult. And that's sort of similar to predicting the future of quantum. All right, and now we have warfare of the future. And um, I, this slide, I, I found it a couple months ago. I think it was on LinkedIn. And it was because a number of people in the national security community were essentially mocking it. And you know, because we hear so much about quantum and, and there is quite a bit of hype in the space. And this slide basically, you know, it, it would make you think that, um, everything soon is going to be quantum. Well, we are a ways out, but there, there is a basis for all of these things that are, that are listed here. And I think pretty much every one is, is under development and, and has been concluded as absolutely possible, except for maybe quantum radar. Uh, China has announced they, they have a quantum radar capability uh, that's certainly subject to a lot of scrutiny. There are a number of, of physicists and others who say that that's actually not possible. But in general, you know, things on this, this chart um, are being actively worked on. If you just want to go look up some of the DARPA work that's going on in DARPA uh, contracts related to quantum, you'll see uh, mention of, of many of these aspects. So going back to China, um, you know, we do have to think about you know, how much are they pouring into the, the quantum uh, world. Uh, they're certainly in the lead uh, patent wise. Uh, they've invested over $10 billion in, in the technology. The U.S. Is, is about at $2 billion, so there's certainly a large gap there. Um, they, China has a 4 million square foot facility in their country. They've launched a quantum satellite. Um, and generally, their focus is more on the quantum networking side to keep their communication secure. I would say if we look back to the United States, um, Europe, and, and some other players around the world, there's been much more focus on quantum computing. And then, you know, sort of the one that, that doesn't get as much focus as I've already talked about is quantum sensing. And that's an area where uh, my company, we're working pretty heavily and there's certainly um, a lot of interest from the US government in, in quantum sensing. So uh, that's generally the overview of, of quantum that I, I have for you and, you know, I, the question is sort of why do I spend my time, you know, doing a, a, a discussion like this? And yeah, sure, it's it's good for my company to get our name out there, but you know, I seriously doubt anyone here is going to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars on a quantum matter machine in the next quarter. Uh, I do this really because you know I believe that quantum it's going to be a platform shift, and it's going to um, fundamentally sort of change our thinking and the way we do certain things. And you know, I, th I think it's going to unlock areas of research that you know, we didn't even know possible. And it's going to help us you know, explain some of the underpinnings of our universe in, in a way that just has not been possible yet. And you know, we know that physics is a, it's an incomplete field and that there are um, other laws waiting to be discovered. And there's just still so much that, that we don't know. And you know, to study and apply this, is really to fundamentally question um, everything and to be humble and to recognize that, you know, the tradition of, of what we've learned of how the world works, you know, that doesn't always equate to truth. 
And you know, we, we have this, um, we all have this ability or opportunity for constant renewal and, and learning and discovery, you know, who we are as a people and um, how we're all interconnected and sort of quantum mechanics is, is really the, the foundation of that. And you know, I think one of the, the hardest but also most courageous things is to change our minds. And quantum you know, reveals that, that we've, we've really had to change our minds over the past hundred years about how the world works. And so, you know, I hope if nothing else, the, the lecture makes you more curious about quantum and that ultimately it gives you uh, more questions than it does answers. So that's it for me. I welcome any questions. Please post your questions in the Q&A section and we'll draw on those for uh, Laura to answer. So I see one here in the chat, um, protein folding and pharmaceuticals um, from Richard. Yeah, that's absolutely one application space. And, you know, uh, here I was more focused on national security, but if we take a step back, I mean, like I, I did mention economic security is national security. And um, the pharmaceutical space is one area that we're really looking very heavily towards to see what, you know, how can we apply some of these very hard problems, how can we map them onto uh, our quantum computer? How can we deduce it into a mathematical expression that then we can run the gates from a quantum computer on it? Um, protein folding is certainly in there. There are a number of middleware application companies that are doing this sort of applications research. There's one that's called Menton AI. If you, you're um, curious and, and you'd like to look into more of how they're doing research to, to figure out how they can apply quantum to um, the pharmaceutical industry. Well, I can't post in the Q&A, so I'll, I'll ask one. Uh, a lot of the quantum effects that we're interested in, both from a computing and a sensing standpoint at least, uh, require very, very cold environments very highly noise-free environments. And so they're not very portable and, and very expensive um, and uh, large. S yeah. Do you see much there as likely to change in the next decade? Yes, yes definitely. I mean, for my company, I mean, that's one area of, of significant focus for us is how do we get the, uh, swap, which is size, weight, and power, and then swap C, size, weight, and power, and cost down and get it into a portable, um, something that can be deployed and that is also very rugged and can withstand you know, changes in the environment. I think the, the really interesting thing about the way cold quanta does it, and we're called cold quanta because we use cold atom technology. And yes, we're, we're cooling the atoms down to near absolute zero, but we're not doing it with these very large refrigeration units. Um, if you look at some of the other modalities of, of quantum technology, quantum computing, they're having to use these really large cryogenic systems to get the temperature down so the atoms are stable enough to perform gates and computations on. Whereas we're using lasers. And right now, you know, the, the challenge is laser technology. And laser technology, if you sort of look at the, the trend, it's it's there, there have been so many breakthroughs. So if we're using lasers to cool the atoms. The question is, is how small can we get the lasers and how rugged can we get these lasers to be? So we're getting it down to a package that's truly small enough to deploy, you know, uh, on a drone, for example, where there's not a lot of space um, that's left over from everything else that's, that's on the device. Uh, things that are easier are certainly ships. You know, they're probably one of the first platforms where, where these types of devices will be deployed because they're so large and you know, they have the space that we don't necessarily have to have the small size yet. Um, but that's certainly a, a, an area that I think within the next 10 years, you know, it, it really is, it's an, it's an engineering challenge. Um, it, it's, not, it's not a physics challenge anymore. It's just, can we get the right people together and the resources that we need to actually build these devices?
Um, okay, I see a question here. Would a nation state be able to build a quantum appliance dedicated to one function, Shor's algorithm, for example, or would they always need to develop a general purpose computer or a combination of general appliance and, high, I guess, HP? Um, that, you know, I'm not really the right person to ask that question. I can say that um, there's the, the, the technology and resource needs that would go into building a quantum computer that is large enough and powerful enough to run Shor's algorithm and thus break encryption. It, it, would, it, it would be, it would absolutely be a nation state that would, would have to do that given the resources that would be needed. Um, there is discussion, could you create a device that does not have to have all the properties of a quantum computer, but just specifically focuses on breaking Shor's algorithm. And I know that that is something that's being debated um, among uh, a lot of people in the US government right now. All right, any other questions? I see three more in the Q&A that Can you see them or would you like them read to you? Okay. Yeah. Do you think that this will be able to remove the new crypto standards and update TLS before quantum can break them? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, the, to break encryption, I think, like I said, you know, we're sort of in the range of a couple hundred qubits right now, and, and we would need um, a lot more than that to, to actually break encryption. From you know the intelligence community perspective and, and national security perspective, it's it's more about you. Know, we know that other countries are harvesting our data, and it's it's just not the U.S. government that needs to be concerned about this. It's really any institution, especially a financial institution, for example. If if the data you know will, will be still extremely sensitive 15 years from now, when we might have a quantum computer that's capable of breaking encryption. You know, what information at that time that was generated today and transmitted today and harvested and collected today will still be um, incredibly uh, vulnerable or make us vulnerable if read. And, you know, any other questions, I'm happy to answer them, but I'm also happy to point you in the right direction, you know, physicist or one of our engineers that, that can answer it. Um, I'm also, you know, I would share some some things that I've read recently that, you know, have sort of helped me think about the problem. Um, one was uh, anything by Scott Aronson. He, he's a bit sardonic in his approach to things. And, and he certainly, um, he's a mathematician and he has very choice words for the physics and physicist sort of view of, of quantum, but he has a really good book um, and it's quantum computing since Democritus. I found that extremely helpful. And then again, Carlo Ravelli, he recently released a book, um, Helgeland, and it's sort of, it goes from the beginning of quantum theory and how that's being uh, spun out today into actual applications. I have another question there in the uh, Q&A. Okay. So the question is a Forbes piece last week made a point about USA focusing on NIST and Europe focusing on um, post-quantum um, algorithms and Europe focusing on QKD, uh, quantum key distribution and other quantum crypto tech. Where do you stand? Um, yeah, that, that's, I mean, that's absolutely, I have not read that article, but, but there is a, a, more of a focus in the US on actually creating the, the algorithms, whereas Europe seems to be quite a ways ahead with QKD, yeah, you know, there is some QKD work that's going on in the in the U.S. I, I, I imagine a number of you are, are tracking it. There's some out of the University of Chicago. Um, you know, it remains to be seen. I, we're kind of getting messaging from NSA here in the U.S. and with the U.K. government as well that don't don't look to QKD as the answer to all of your um, cybersecurity problems. And it really goes back to the point that. Sure, the, the information may be extremely secure, and theoretically, you, you can't can't eavesdrop on it. But that's you know from point to point. What what happens if 
if the device or you know some other point of, of that communication chain is compromised that it's not necessarily the the message in transit that we're so worried about today um, it, it's 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 more that um, there are so many different ways to um, to compromise information um, where do I stand you know I don't know I, I my company, we really don't focus on the quantum networking aspect as much. Uh, I'm just sort of a, an observer here waiting to see how it all plays out. So Gavin, I think your question is going to be a bit too technical for me to answer. Okay, I see uh, Richard has his hand raised also. Yeah, a bit of a follow up. Um, I've heard that the next generation of GPS is, be is beginning to be deployed. So is the risk to GPS not so much that it's insecure because the next generation is supposed to be super secure, but is the risk to GPS that the satellites can be shot down? Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard debates on both sides. I think the idea that the satellite can be shot down, well, that brings with it a whole question of intention and, and, and willingness from another country to actually do that. And what would the repercussions be if a, if a country shot down one of our satellites? I mean, it's almost sort of like mutually assured destruction in that case. So from the angle that, that we're approaching, it is you know, it, not only can you get away from the vulnerabilities of GPS, but you actually can create a navigation device that's much more precise than GPS. So when you combine those two things together, you know, why would you use GPS when you have something that, that doesn't have the vulnerability and is better? And of course, the reason is because of cost and because we're still in the, you know, the earlier days of, of prototyping um, this technology. It looks like we've run out of questions here and we're just about to the end of the uh, seminar session. Uh, so thank you so much yeah. for visiting and uh, getting people to think a little bit about some of the issues that are involved. Uh, this is going to be an area of considerable change during the careers of most of the people here listening. And uh, it, it's a good idea to start thinking about it sooner rather than later. So uh, we look forward to uh, perhaps having you visit us again at another time. Yeah, uh, my pleasure. And you know, if anyone would like to reach out if there are other questions or areas of discussion, you know, feel free to contact me on LinkedIn. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, everybody, thank you for attending today. Uh, please tune in next week for our next speaker. We'll be continuing this through the summer and hopefully providing some uh, very interesting ideas along the way as we did today. So goodbye and, and have a pleasant afternoon.